All right. As you can tell, today we are joined by a record-setting starting quarterback for the Philadelphia Stars. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. The cult hero, Mr. Case Cookus himself, joins us today. Case, thank you for joining us. How are you doing today so far? I'm doing good. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're just going to dive right into this one. Uh, we talked about it just a bit off camera a minute ago. Um, you actually played some wide receiver in high school before ultimately transitioning back to quarterback. Um, how did that all come about, and how did you ultimately transition back to quarterback at Thousand Oaks? Yeah, so I, you know, I started at quarterback uh, my freshman and sophomore year uh, on the freshman and sophomore teams, and then uh, from there, my junior year, there was a, a returning quarterback who was a senior uh, who threw for a bunch of yards, and I ended up going to my coach and you know telling him, "Hey, I'll be the backup quarterback, but I, I want to play and uh, help out the team as much as possible." So I uh, ended up making the switch to wide receiver. Uh, played a little defense as, as well, and, and then, like we were kind of joking about, I I play a mean cover two corner, so that was it was a lot of fun and got to learn a lot uh, during that process. And then the next year was like my first year on varsity playing quarterback. I I just I have a quick question about that. Did you find your time playing wide receiver and cornerback? Did you find the transition back to quarterback? Did you understand the position a little bit better? because you had that experience with those two, those two positions. Yeah, absolutely. Like the, it, you learn so much, um, the different positions, what, what, um, what stresses that position, what's hard, what's difficult, what's maybe easy, what's, you know, maybe an excuse that some guys throw out there, you know, maybe I threw one or, Oh, I'm getting tired and all that stuff. So you're just trying to, uh, you learn a lot through, you know, putting yourself in someone else's shoes, um, and it, and I think it made me able to communicate a little better with some of those wide receivers and defensive guys, just kind of understanding uh, what they're going through. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things that another thing that surprised me, I should say, about your career is I was not actually aware that you attended a JUCO before you ended up at NAU. Um, it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you attended Ventura J Junior College, was it? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, it. <laughs> Don't want to bore you guys too much, but basically, uh, you know, I, like we talked about with me playing wide receiver and then quarterback, I wasn't highly recruited because you kind of get as a quarterback, get recruited off of your uh, junior film um, and guys are kind of already committed and, and dialed in. So I had, a, I had a few teams that kind of fell off at the end that were interested, but didn't end up pulling the trigger on a scholarship offer. So I decided to go to Ventura College and gray shirt there. Um, and coach Mushagi and the head coach, um, we talked about, cause I was out of high school. I was six, two and like 175 pounds at most, you know? So I was a tall skinny guy, but then after that year, I grew another, you know, inch, inch and a half. So I got to like a full six, three and a half, six, four. Uh, I think my, my bios is six, four and, and cleats, I, you know, but, uh, so I, I put on a little weight as well. I got to like 195 and kind of became more of a, a, a prospect at quarterback, a little bigger and stronger, uh, just kind of a late bloomer. And then from there, um, had a lot of interest from, you know, some Pac-12 teams, Mountain West teams, but Eddie U came along and actually offered me, uh, they had brought in a few guys, uh, junior college guys, and uh, they had offered me about three days after a workout, like a camp, and then three weeks later, I was trying to start or fight for the starting position and ended up winning it uh, during that summer camp. So it was, it was really fast turnover, very, very quick and weird story. But yeah, I did go to Ventura. <laughs> Interesting. Um, so as a freshman, when you ended up at NAU, you ended up starting right away and putting up impressive immediate numbers immediately. Uh, however, over your five seasons with the club, you had, was it three different offensive coordinators? Yes, it was three different offense coordinators. Uh, how do you believe that prepared you for uh, your your future in professional football where you kind of bounced around and had to learn a bunch of different offenses? Yeah, I, you know, I think at the time, you know, it was a it was a bummer having to in college kind of bounce back and forth and and handle the whole schoolwork mixed with learning offenses. But I didn't realize how much it would eventually help me. Because I think I, I don't even think I can count how many offenses I've I've learned or been a part of now at this point. Uh, I think at one point in 2021, I had learned or like learned the first five installs of I think it was five offenses. So and that was all within like a 
three month span of each other. So it just, you know, it was offense after offense after offense. So, um, you know, obviously in college, it was, um, you know, a little bit different with some of the concepts, but when it, when it broke it down, having to, to learn more about like the coaches themselves, like how they, they want you to run their offense. And I, you learn a lot about like how people, you know, want their offense to come across, I guess. And so everyone's just slightly different, even though some of the concepts are the same. Uh, some coaches want you to approach it a little different. And so um, that was one thing I, I learned a lot through my three offensive coordinators at NEU. I, I, you mentioned 2021, and I just want to bring that up real quick because I I have your your Wikipedia page. <laughs> first, first of all, how cool is it to have a Wikipedia page for you to be able to see that? Just type in your name at any given time and look at that. <laughs> I, I, it's pretty good. My wife does it. Uh, more than me sometimes like <laughs> people ask me questions and I, i'll forget but my wife will do it and she'll be like did you know this i'm like no i didn't but that's really cool though that's uh so it's it is pretty cool <laughs> so your your wikipedia page credits you with four uh four different teams in 2021 broncos vikings raiders and then you were with the cfl edmonton elks yes um how I just I'm very curious. This was going to be one that I think I was going to say for a little bit later, but I just seeing it from 2021. How different is the CFL game from the outdoor game here in America? Yeah, it's um, it's it's tough because obviously there's some crossover with concepts and things like that. But that extra man was was very different to me. Um, some of the motions like took about you know a few days to get used to. That wasn't the weirdest part. It was more so the space with that extra guy mixed in and then some of the rules um took me a little bit longer where it's like you get a, a you know a, a point if you kick it through the end zone whether it's a right. punt or if you know if a missed field goal and all that stuff so some of that i remember sitting there the first game and the scoreboard's going up i'm like what's going on here uh, you know because i kind of got put into it so fast uh i think like i got a call from edmonton and next thing you know, I was up in Canada like the next week. So I was like still like studying my like rule book online, trying to figure it all out. Um, but it is it is very different. You know, I think um, some guys, it fits their style of play. Um, for me, you know, I kind of looking back and I had some conversations with a few different people about it. I think the American game fits me a little bit better. Um, and that's why I kind of ended up choosing the, to do the USFL over maybe going back to the CFL. That's fair. Um, it, it, we talked about a year like 2021 where you bounce around a little bit. You actually spent some time with the TSL in 2021 as well, correct? Yes, yeah. <clears throat> so five different organizations, more or less. I mean, how difficult is it at for, for a player to deal with a season like that where you're kind of bouncing around, you can never really get your feet set at any point in time? Yeah, I think like the hardest part is getting over like the mental side of it of going like like either blaming the org organization or or you know looking to yourself well, like oh like like I just suck or you know you have to get over the mental part of it because a lot of the times a lot of the decisions are just out of your hand you know I I remember when I signed with Denver you know I was all excited it was my first kind of uh, introduction to an off season with an NFL team. Um, and I'm getting all fired up. And then next thing you know, the next week they're like, Hey, we can't keep a fourth quarterback. We're in the middle of a quarterback battle. So it's like trying to get over the mental, like, Oh, like, like it's my fault or it's this or that. And of course you ask the coaches like what you can do better. Cause of course, if you know, they're cutting you, there still is a reason and you want to learn from every team you're with. But a lot of the times it's, um, out of your control and there's nothing you can do about it so you just got to get back to work and start plugging away how did you yourself handle the 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 mental side of it like you were just talking about do you think you handled it you know well enough i mean you're obviously grinding to be able to can stay on radars and stuff but how did you feel like you handled it yeah i think um i learned a lot from the first time when i got cut from the giants because it it felt like it's such a shock but it was during that covid year so I found myself kind of making some excuses when I, I shouldn't have. Um, and so from there, I was a little more prepared going into the next few times where it's, it's like, okay, talk to them and ask some questions. Hey, what can I do better? Uh, you know, what didn't you like from me? And I think from that 
conversation. You know, most of them are pretty honest with you about, hey, you know, we we'd like your t- you know spiral to be a little tighter, or we'd like your footwork to be a little clean. They'll give you some some uh, things to work on. Uh, and then from there, you just you go work on them and you stay positive. You can't sit there and um, and worry about it and complain and do this because it just, you know, you, you're you going to get a spiral of like negativity and you just have to kind of stay positive through it all. Um, and, and most of the time you just try to focus on getting better. And that's how you take your mind off all that other stuff of the what ifs. Absolutely. Um, so in 2021, as we touched on just a moment ago, you spent some time with the Spring League, the Generals, coached by Bart Andrews. Um, how long did you spend with the Generals at that time before you signed with Denver? <laughs> so I was with the Generals for a week and a half. Um, you know, at the week mark, we had got a call from the Raiders and the Broncos, and we were, were sitting there and um, – me and my agent had long talks about trying to, whether it was, do we want the film or do we want to go do these mini camps? And we ended up deciding to do the mini camps. Um, so I ended up leaving the spring league at about the week and a half point, tried out with the Raiders um, at that time before. Then the next week tried out with the Broncos. Um, and then they signed me that the, the last day of the camp and then spent about a week, week or week and a half there. So in basically a span of three weeks, you were with the TSL, you tried out with the Raiders, signed with the Broncos, and were released? Yes. Yep, pretty much. <laughs> Talk about a whirlwind month. I mean, I can't even imagine trying to deal with that as a player. So, I mean, it, it, kudos to you to keep going after all of that. Yeah, it's. I think, um, you know, that, that year, um, especially getting away from COVID, though, um, because COVID was so weird um, for like camp. It, it didn't feel like I was like, not to say a part of the team, because of course you are, but we're, we were doing meetings like this the whole time. So, you know, it didn't feel like I was really like a part of the football team. We're just sitting over a computer. And then next thing you know, we're, you know, um, we're in uh, New York doing an acclimation period and all that stuff. And they're like, oh, we got to cut the roster to 80. Uh, and I hadn't even like really thrown a football in front of them. So, to be able to get in front of teams, like it was like it felt like my career, even though I was getting cut, was trending in the right direction. Um, and I know that sounds weird because, like, oh, okay, so you got cut from you know three teams in one year. It's like, well, yeah, but like, like from the previous year, it was so different. I was able to make an impact um, and you know try out and impress people enough to be able to get signed. Uh, and then learn from all those different situations and learn these different playbooks and make connections with all these different coaches. Absolutely. I mean, I would say that, yes, you got released from several teams, but like we said, five different organizations were showing interest to in you in the at the professional level. So, I mean, that shows that, like you said, you were trending in the right direction. Uh, but how early on did you know the Spring League was going to be moving on and becoming the USFL? So at the time of the spring, like I had no, no idea, uh, you know, my agents had um, a, a decent connection uh, apparently with some of the ownership and things like that. So they had a better idea, but at the time I was more focused on just whatever team I was on. Um, and then when we finished with Canada, um, we decided to just take a couple of weeks to think about what we want to do before we re-signed with a, the Ed- Edmonton team or do something else. And during that period is when the spring league kind of sent out their initial, Hey, we're interested in you sign our contract. Um, so it actually, uh, I didn't really realize until I had, you know, had a few conversations and, and signed that the, the initial contract to enter like the draft pool. Uh, you know, they had to draft the whole, you know, the whole league last year. So it was a little bit different than what they did this year. Uh, but it was, Shortly after that at Edmonton, so um, through like February, like January, February um, after the 2020 year. So 2022, like during that period we is when I kind of figured out that's what, what we wanted to do. When you left Edmonton and you were contemplating 
you know, your future, obviously. And the USFL had, you know, was coming back and, uh, and whatnot when you made that contract. Was Canada a spot because you, where you said it was like really different for you from the transition from the American side to the Canadian side? Was the Canadian Football League really something that you enjoyed as an experience? And was it something that you would have considered going back to if, you know, these spring, these spring leagues hadn't returned the way that they did? I think I, I definitely <clears throat> would have considered it. Um, like we kind of talked about earlier, I don't know if my play style fits the, the Canadian game. But at the same time, like, I love football so much. So I, I feel like if that was the, the option, I probably – would have ended up taking it. You only get so long um, to play football in your career. And, uh, you know, after talking to my wife, we, we have long talks about it because it's like, like I obviously want to be in the U S as much as time with her and things like that. Um, so it, it is a tough decision, but if it was the only league out there, I definitely would, would have uh, gone back and played. Just shows that you have a, a deeper love for the game and you you have to be in it. I, I love that. So uh, last season with the USFL, as I kind of talked about in our intro, you went from from a guy who was basically a journeyman NFL quarterback bouncing around all these squads to a cult hero for Stars fans. I mean, everywhere you go, everybody's talking about Case Cookus. When is he going to be back? Are we getting him back on the team? Um, how has it felt going from a season in 2021 where you played for five different teams to a team in 2022 where once you became the starter, it was basically your team. Yeah, I think um, the one thing that, you know, I miss the most about football when you're bouncing around is the team. You know, you, you get on there and you get with your guys and you, you spend however many weeks and months together just grinding for one goal, you know. And so I was so lucky – to be, you know, you know, signed by the stars or drafted by the stars, and then uh, from there be able to to be a part of that team because there's so many like great guys. So that was like the first part was just like being a part of it and and being with them and having fun and being out there on the field because I think we all share a common goal. It's like we all love football and love doing this, uh, and so it was awesome to be a part of like that group i think that group is and and it's awesome to be able to get them all pretty much back this year which is crazy um so that, that's super exciting as well so that part of it was the first initial like this is awesome i love being being here being with the team being a part of the usfl such a great opportunity that the usfl has created for got a lot of guys like me who have kind of bounced around so much and then from there you know once i started playing a little bit it was like it the, the competitive juices started rolling it's like all right let's get after this thing hey we got a shot at winning this thing um and we kind of put together a little bit of a run there and obviously um had a shot to win at the end and didn't uh, didn't work out the way we wanted but uh, it was awesome to be a part of that team I, i'm gonna ask this this was <laughs> This was on my list to ask a little bit later. Sam knows where I'm going to go with this one, I believe. Um, so coming up short in the championship game kind of spiraled for the city of Philadelphia, as we all know at this <laughs> point in time, uh, the amount of championship games that they have come so close on. Do you have a chip on your shoulder, especially coming back to Philadelphia this year and seeing the heartbreak that that city has gone through in the last nine to 10 months with the championship games, do you have a, 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 a larger chip on your shoulder than normal just to kind of be like, I know we can do this. And if things had just fallen right for us, we could have brought that championship to Philadelphia for the city of Philadelphia. No, absolutely. You know, I think um, obviously for me, it's a little extra big of a chip because of the way, you know, I went out and, and a break in my leg and all this stuff. So, but, but besides that, you know, I think, it didn't really hit me about the, the Philly thing until I stepped back and I was like, holy cow, like this city, like what is happening? You know, it was just kind of one of those things where it's like, it's hard to believe. Like if you just told someone that, you know, that the three teams had lost in the, the champion or four teams had lost in the championship. It's like, wait, are you, are you serious? Like what? Like, I don't think someone would believe you uh, if you just kind of said it five years down the road or something. So of course, like we're, we want to, we want to win this thing for Philly. We want to win it, obviously for ourselves because we were all there. But um, I think you can't get caught too much into that of like getting ahead of yourselves because we are just going, 
going into week one. So I know a lot of the guys are going to be hungry and, and positive towards it, but we got to keep it under control, learn, you know, learn the offense, start and install one uh, and start slow. And then just start one week at a time. Cause if you get too ahead of yourselves, trying to like, just get right back to the championship, you're going to end up, uh, you know, letting games slip away that we shouldn't. So as much as of course we want to get back there and win one for the city, it's like, okay, we got to take this one week at a time. Uh, not to get too ahead of ourselves. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to look at things. Uh, so approach. speaking of which, approach, we're heading into 2023. Uh, you're coming off a championship loss, but you guys look stacked. I mean, you've brought in former first round pick Corey Coleman. You got Jordan Soul back. You got Chris Rowland coming back. Terry Wright's coming in. Uh, Bug Howard's back. Dexter Williams back. William Matt Colburn's back. I mean, I could go on for days. This offense is stacked. So, do you believe the Stars have made the necessary moves to improve enough to go from championship appearance to championship victory in 2023? Yeah, I think um, without even the guys we added, if you just had the guys that came back, minus uh, Maurice and Bulu, who ended up you know, making their runs in the NFL there, we obviously wish them the best of luck and uh, success that they're going to have. But um, you know, I think if we just brought back our – our team from last year, we would have had a, a pretty solid team across the board. And then you start naming all these other names. It's like, holy cow. You know, I think uh, Bart, he called me a few times during the process and was like, hey, we just picked up so-and-so. Hey, we just picked up so I'm like, how many guys are you going to – like, how are we going to get this much better? So it's awesome. Um, again, you know, we're a team that's going to sprout the ball. So it's awesome for all of them because a lot of guys are going to get a lot of touches. Um and hopefully um, they're going to be doing all the work and I won't have to run around as much. <laughs> so I can just be lazy back there and hand it to Matt and Dexter and, and get the ball out to those wide receivers and tight ends and let them run around and, and do the things that make them so special. Because, you know, you list all their names and I, I get a smile just thinking about it. So I, I'm very excited to get to work with all those guys again uh, and, and adding in those new guys. So I'm, I'm really excited about our weapons. Absolutely. How could you not be? I mean, uh, you have an offensive head coach that just kind of tailor made this offense to your your skill set, quite honestly. I mean, a lot of these guys are, you know, yard after the catch type, type guys. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how this offense goes in 2023. So uh, <clears throat> we mentioned the time that it took for you to kind of sign a USFL deal. Um, it, it was a little bit later. Some of the fans were kind of anticipating you coming back. Um, with the XFL also on the horizon as well, did you consider any XFL opportunities in 2023? Yeah, you know, so I had um, the my Edmonton head coach, Jamie Elizondo, was um, the offensive coordinator for the Brahmas, I believe. Um, so, uh, you know, he had texted back and forth a few times. Um, it was something that I, I really didn't consider too much um, because of how much I enjoyed the, uh, the USFL the, the connections I had made, I felt like the, the league did such a good t job taking care of us. In their first year, uh, obviously there were some growing pains, but they did such a good job addressing any issues or anything that came up uh, and communicating pretty well with us. So um, although it was an option that kind of came up, I, I didn't consider it um, too much because I, I was just so happy uh, playing for the Stars last year. Um, you know, the, the, the hesitancy and how long I took to make my decision was really figuring out NFL stuff. You know, it had nothing to do with really the XFL or any of that stuff. And because um, obviously my dream is to, you know, play in the NFL and, and try to my, work my way up uh, in that league. But uh, it just trying to figure it out, you know, a lot of movement in the NFL with head coaches, quarterbacks, who know who knows what the draft's going to do for quarterbacks and all that stuff. So. Um, it, it took a little bit longer to try to figure out. And um, after having a, lots of conversations with different coaches and my agents, and we just felt like it was the right opportunity to get some more film, uh, show, you know, my ankle's fine, uh, move around good on it. It's feeling good. And uh, to play, you know, hopefully 12 more games out here uh, in the U.S. Well, well, new, new hub city, so we'll be in Ann Arbor and, and move into a few different cities. So I'm excited about that. Obviously, we wish we could play in front of the Philly fans a little more, but um, uh, hopefully a few guys travel for us. But that was really it, though. It was just trying to 
feeling out some NFL future deals. Um, and we ended up deciding we want the film and want to play and, and have some fun. And then at the end of it, bring home a championship for Philip. I, I was going to ask about the uh, broken ankle or, or leg. I, I, I was, was it your ankle more than it was your leg? Or? Yes. So um, to, it's hard to describe. I, I, so many doctors talk to me. I, I, don't, I don't understand all the lingo. But basically, I broke my fibula. Um, they ended up putting a rod in my oh, fibula. Yeah. And then a piece of my ankle um, broke as well. Um, oh. Luckily, all the tendons and everything stayed intact. So my doctor actually said I got pretty lucky um, because if the tendons didn't stay intact, it could have been a longer recovery and, and all that stuff. So they, you know, they ended up... Um, uh, Dr. Reed, he did the surgery uh, there in California. Um, so he, you know, he put the metal rod in and put some other screws and stuff to secure up the ankle. So it's feeling good. Uh, I got married uh, five days after I had surgery. So I was, I was rolling on a scooter <laughs> down the aisle. I, uh, my wife wasn't too happy about the scooter, but I told her I'd make it up to her with some <laughs> pictures and stuff. But so, uh, the, yeah, the ankle was, was taken care of good. Um, and we're excited about the. Uh, I'm excited about getting around and and showing that uh, I'm good and ready to roll. Very nice. I was actually kind of surprised to see that you had signed with the the Rams as quickly as you did after the injury. I mean, I, I, it was encouraging to me because it meant that you had healed very quickly. But I mean, I heard broken leg in the championship game, and I was like, man, I, hopefully he's ready for you know 2023 for the stars, let alone the 2022 U.S. or I mean NFL season. Pardon me. Um, so I'm kind of curious. I mean, obviously, I spoke about it a couple times already. You've kind of become this cult hero for Philadelphia Stars fans. Um, it, you're in the championship game. You're facing a guy in Jamar Smith, who is basically the exact same thing for Birmingham Stallions fans on the opposite side of the field. How important is it for a league like the USFL to kind of I don't, play into the fact that you guys are becoming stars for the league? Yeah, I think um... – you know, th that stuff, uh, it, it's tough because obviously you get a, the walk the line of the cockiness and the confidence. And, um, um, but, of course, I think uh, having some talks this offseason, you know, the USFL wants to, you know, show us off and, and kind of help connect with the cities as well. Because I think um, if the fans can get to know us um, and then watch us play, I think um, – you know, you, you become a fan sometimes through um, getting to know the guy rather than just knowing like, oh, he's, you know, such a good player. So getting to know that I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm a regular guy and, you know, I got little quirks and uh, just like everyone else. And it's, you know, I think it's important to, you know, do things like this and have interviews and, and talk and uh, just because the, the league is in its second year and not, you know, not every single person out there knows what the USFL is about. And, uh, you know, of course we're going to play some good football and you can turn it on Fox and watch, but also there's some great guys and great people in the league that have some really cool stories. And I encourage anyone out there to just do some research on any of your favorite players and just kind of get to know what their story is. And, uh, you know, mine's a weird one going from, you know, high school receiver, junior college, you know, NAU getting cut from however many different teams uh, and then ended up on the star. So a lot of guys have cool stories like that. And I encourage anyone to to get to know their favorite players and, and reach out. A lot of the guys are really good about getting back and, and, and reaching out with the fans. Absolutely. Um, a little shameless plug, but it, it's because of men like yourself that have been so humble and have given us the time that we've had interviews with men like Cody Brown, Dexter Williams. Uh, we got Terry Wright coming up tomorrow. You know, Brad Miller, the defensive coordinator, Brandon McGuire, the defensive lineman or defensive line coach, pardon me, Adam Rodriguez. I mean, you guys have been out here trying to spread the message of the USFL, you know, promote the league, show that it's an opportunity for players like yourself. And uh, we have been very lucky to have a lot of you guys on. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time. Thank you to all the other Stars players, coaches who have joined us, who have taken the opportunity to kind of let us tell their story a little bit. It means a lot to us here at Shady Sports Network and USFL News Hub as well. So, uh, again, thank you for your time. Uh, Michael, you got some more questions? You know, honestly, I, I had 
written out a couple, but I, I was looking at your Wikipedia page because, <laughs> you know, I, I I wanted to dive in a little bit. And I always find little weird, you know, quirky things here. <clears throat> in 2017, when you were at NAU, you played a game against Montana. I don't know if you know where I'm going with this or not. <laughs> yes, uh, <clears throat> you were ejected for targeting for throwing a downfield block. First of all, I commend you for throwing a downfield block as a quarterback because, you know, very rarely do we see that. Uh, it, what happened? I mean, is there, <laughs> is there like a story to this or did you so, just so miscalculate? I, I, <laughs> so I, I, the story won't do the full service. So if anyone's listening to this, just look up like Case Cook is targeting on Twitter. It'll pop up. But basically, it was a trick play. And uh, we, we tossed the ball to the left. Um, the running back tossed it back to the tight end, who had a big arm. And he was actually supposed to throw it to me. After I pitched it, I was going to wheel up the right side of, of the field. And so um, we had run a lot of trick plays that year already. So Montana, when I got outside, there was like three guys guarding me and I was like, all right, well, and so the tight end ended up tucking the ball and turning up the field up the right sideline. And so I stopped running and peeled back to try to throw a block and help out. And, you know, I haven't blocked anyone. And since I could, I was a wide receiver at my junior year of high school. So um, I didn't use the best form and I ended up throwing a block uh, and kind of just threw a shoulder into him. Well, unfortunately the guy was like leaning forward so his head was like right there and i ended up kind of hitting him and um like kind of on the top of the head and he popped it he's fine you know i just want to throw that out there i didn't hurt anyone uh it was kind of a weak hit uh to be honest but he was already kind of falling over so i did knock him over uh, initially i thought it was a uh taunting penalty because i did say a few things when i knocked him over uh we don't need to get into what i said but um <laughs> So and then they called targeting and I was I was pretty shocked and initially I got in the, the huddle and I'm like don't worry about it guys like this won't be targeting um, it, it by the rule it was probably targeting um, I know the Montana fans they all think it was targeting all the NEU fans think it was not targeting but uh, it is what it is but it's a funny story now to tell um, you know I I didn't want to leave the game I really didn't know what to do. I started screaming at all the refs and uh, made a big show of it. They, the Montana fans were throwing snowballs at me uh, in a couple beers while I was walking off. So they gave me a nice little uh, exit, exit to party there. But, uh, yeah, it's it's a funny story now. At the time, it, I, was, I was pretty pissed off. I was going to say uh, you're probably heated, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. So, But it's a very uh, – I think unofficially I'm the first quarterback ever to get ejected for targeting. I I was just going to say, I think, <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard of that anywhere else. So I, that's why I, I, I kind of like drew me to it. So <laughs> Exactly. Uh, speaking of things that quarterbacks don't normally do, while I was doing my research, we kind of breezed past this, but you actually caught a 23-yard t- touchdown pass in college as well. Was that on a similar play? <laughs> yeah, so that, well, that's funny. That takes me back. So my first game, this isn't this story, but I'll tell you two real quick. My first game, I had a shot at catching a touchdown, running, and throwing a touchdown. But we, again, trick play, when they, they threw it to me, I actually ran out of bounds. And I was, in the, I was in the end zone, and my foot came down out of bounds. So I missed out on like having like a really cool first game. Um, still a super metal. We ended up winning the game and everything. But I was like super bummed because the guy that threw it had a perfect completion percentage. Uh, and he was like, dude, you're ruining my completion for them. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, w- we obviously had a lot of fun in college because we ran a few trick plays. But so this one, I believe it was against Illinois State. Um, and we threw like a wide receiver bubble screen to the right. Um, and so he was obviously, it was a lateral, so it was behind me. And then I backed up and a whole wall of guys kind of lined up in front of me. So the whole offensive line lined up. And so they created like a wall up the sideline they threw it back to me and i i just jogged right in they were like it was it was it's like that scene from uh um what is it uh the longest yard where they're just like decking everyone on the way up you know or it's like they were just like hitting everyone and i just kind of like jogged in and it was super cool a lot of a lot of fun that was a fun one but yeah so i got my receiving touchdown (laughs) 
That's awesome. That's awesome. Michael, do you have any more questions? Not really. I mean, I I didn't realize how impressive your college stats were overall. I, yeah. I'll be honest with you. I had no idea, um, but I'm just double checking them with them now. And then, dude, you had, a, you had yourself quite a college career. That's for sure. <laughs> Thank Definitely. you. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Excited to see you this year with Philadelphia as well. Uh, Cause I think that you guys have a very legitimate shot at being able to get yourselves back to the finals. So good luck to you from us here, or at least from me here as well. So. Well, I, I think uh, everybody knows who I'm rooting for this year. I'm not... <laughs> that's awesome. Well, I pre appreciate you guys, and, and thanks for everything you guys do. And uh, that's awesome. I didn't know you guys had talked to so many of the guys on the team already, so that's awesome. I'll have to go check those out and um, appreciate all the work you guys do to, to help us out and get our, our names and, and our messages out there. Absolutely. Um, I mean, we're huge fans of the USFL here. I mean, I've had – countless players from countless different teams. And that's a big reason why I'm such a fan of the league. I mean, you, you learn more about these players. And like you said, a lot of these guys have amazing stories, much like yourself. And it's, it's super interesting to learn more about them as a, a person, not just a player. I mean, to, to me as a fan, a lot of times fans forget that, you know, you guys are more than just a face mask out there on the football field. You know what I mean? There's, there's a person behind that and they've got a story and they've got, you know, their own, family and kids and wives and stuff, all that at home. So it's, it's something that's kind of cool that we're able to tell, you know, a little bit of that background story. But I did have one more question for you before we let you get out of here. Okay. Um, I'm curious, obviously you've kind of built a relationship with Bart Andrews uh, over the, the past year prior to that with your, in, when you're in the TSL with him, um, how involved are you in the, the offensive game planning? Like, are you allowed to kind of give input, uh, you know, Nick's plays that you don't like stuff like that. And, um, how much freedom do you have at the line of scrimmage to audible? So, um, all, like real quick. So audible wise, um, it's really built in for the most part. So, um, whether it's a run play, uh, run plays the easiest to describe. So basically, you know, we have certain run plays we can flip them or, um, if there's a certain look, we just hate, we'll, we'll get to a check. That's how all we all talk about it before. So, you know, we might be, you know, doing all the stuff in the line, but for the most part, usually it's just flipping the play or getting out of one play. Uh, but Bart, Bart's offense, he's done a good job of making it very, very simple. So, you know, anyone can pick it up and understand what we're trying to do um, because, like, he he doesn't want guys sitting out there, you know, you know, trying to get, you know, all this stuff and think and think and think, and then next thing you know, you're like, you're, like, you're, paralyzed what is it paralysis by analysis you know so we're to keep it really simple and, and run you know concepts that are pro level concepts but we're not going to sit there and and do this whole you know hey gun gun truck right scat right 529 f post swing deal where it's we're, we're trying to cut down the verbiage to make sure that you know everyone's on the same page running fast getting out of the huddle fast um and then from there Right. Once everyone's on the same page, that's where we'll add our tweaks, um, whether it's, you know, um, setting a, a route a little higher or getting the guys on the same page in, in the run game and stuff. But Bart does a great job of, of listening to all his guys. Um, he'll never call. So if I don't like a play and I'm just like, I don't get it, coach, uh, like this week, uh, you know, we're saying we're playing, you know, we're playing Memphis first, but we're playing Memphis and we keep running this play and I'm I'm struggling with it. And he's like, hey, do you? Do you want this out? And he does a great job communicating back and forth because he's never just called something just to call it because his ego says it's supposed to work. And he does such a good job communicating with us. Um, so that's where, you know, a lot like the, the offense and why we click so fast a lot of times is because we keep it simple. And, he, you know, he listens to his guys and, and it's about execution rather than having this long worded you know, 19 different motions and shifts. Let's get up to the line and run our stuff uh, because we have such good guys on the outside. Let's get the ball balls into the, the ball into their hands. Well, good luck to you this year, this year case. I, I think that the, uh, the importance of the USFL, you know, the, in, in spring leagues such as this for a lot of guys like yourself that are able to showcase your talents and, 
we know how competitive the NFL is, and but just the fact that you guys want to go out there and love to play football, I think you guys should have a have that opportunity. So uh, definitely, good luck to you this season, and and maybe my team will see your team in the championship. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> No doubt, no doubt. And that's, just so you're aware, that's New Orleans. He's, he's yeah. a New Orleans fan. They're so, close. Uh, They're close last year. Yes, sir. I mean, honestly, um, I expect them to be very good this season as well, especially with that quarterback room they're both <laughs> down there. Um, but once again, thank you so much for your time, Case. It was it was a pleasure speaking with you, learning more about your story. Uh, I definitely am going to be following closely, as you can tell. A huge Philadelphia fan. Um, it, real quick before you get out of here, is there anybody you want to shout out? Uh, anything like that? I always, you know, my wife. I always give her a shout out. I, she she works here. Uh, I'm in Vegas right now, um, so you know when I go off and and travel for for the season, you know I know it's always hard hard on her. So give a shout out to my my wife and you know my fi- family, mom, dad, grandma, and grandpa. I always love shouting them out too. But uh, yeah, so I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. This is your platform as much as it is mine. So I appreciate you coming on um, real quick. Have you been watching the XFL games since you're in Vegas? I've, I've turned off one or two. I haven't been able to go to one. That one I, I saw, it was like really bad weather. So I was not, I was not going to go outside of that, that one. I, um, I, I saw some clips from, but uh, I, you know, I'll watch one or two, uh, you know, for me, I'm trying to focus in on, the upcoming season, getting ready, working out, and kind of stay staying fit. A lot of like rehab still, you know. Like my ankle feels fine, but I like to rehab it a lot. So, but I've caught I've caught a couple, and you know, like you know, it's it's good football. You know, football is football. So if you like football, you know, I I'd suggest watching the U.S. Bell, though. So <laughs> that's Absolutely. where my well, that's where uh, my legions lie. But um, you know, I think there's some good players out there, and when it comes down to it. You know, XFL, USFL, like we're we're guys that you know are getting second opportunities, third opportunities to play football. So uh, it's it's cool seeing those guys run around and make plays. Though it's awesome to see guys that have had these again very cool stories and uh, and unique uh, opportunities get out there and play ball because that's that's what it's about is playing football and love the game. Absolutely, I 100% agree. And what better note to end this interview on than loving the game and playing football. So we're going to go ahead and call it a good one. Thank you so much once again, Case. I appreciate you coming on. This is Brett, and you're watching Shady Sports Network. Tune in, hit that like button. You might wonder, what do these guys do? Player signing announcements. I never in a million years thought you would actually come on to break this news. So without further ado, go ahead and tell everybody what happened today. Yeah, man, uh, I just had to work out with the Cincinnati Bengals. uh, uh, Signing me right out. Um, Without further ado, I'd like to announce that, you know, I'll be taking my talents to Salina Liberty. This just in. The Major League of Football is reportedly collapsing, unable to pay hotel room bills with players being kicked out of their rooms and hotel managers asking them to leave voluntarily without issue. And then we got Lions wide receiver Williams is debuting uh, this week as a starter. That's something to look at um, as far as the eye test goes. And then um, another one on the uh, eye test is Mostert might be coming back to Miami. And we can see if he has a role in this offense um, and see if he can be viable for the next couple weeks coming and help us in the playoffs um, and possibly towards a championship. That would be uh, very nice because he's sitting on my bench right now.